As we uh, enter in the time of hearing from God's word, uh, we want to set the frame for, for what is happening. And so we will read from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 16. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Before certain men f came from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by his hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jews' customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is the word of the Lord. You've probably been in that situation that I'm about to describe. It's the gut-wrenching decision of who do you sit with at the lunch table. This is a particularly stressful situation if you are new, if you're new in school. It reminds me of when I was in college, uh, where I went to college. Uh, I, I already knew people going into it. Uh, I had some family there, some, some friends. Uh, and so I, I kind of came in already knowing some people. But I was always faced with this really stressful situation of, what happens if when I want to go eat, whether it's you know, lunch or dinner, because we all know that college students are never up for breakfast, who do I sit with? And so it's really, really stressful because for me, there was so much of an association and a fear of not having somebody to eat with. So much so that this fear actually kind of overtook my life that if I didn't have somebody to not only sit with at lunch or dinner, but if I didn't have somebody to go with, to the cafeteria, to the dining hall, I wouldn't eat. I would, I would skip that meal because I was so overcome with fear because, you know, what would happen if, if I'm sitting down at the cafeteria and there's no one, there is no one next to me? What does it look like to other people if I'm sitting down and I'm looking around wondering, who's going to talk to me? I hated eating alone because there was this symbol that if I'm eating alone, if no one's eating with me, then I am not accepted. I am not part of this group. And so our passage this morning comes from the book of Galatians in chapter 2. It has to deal with kind of that exact same situation. Peter is confronted with this dilemma of who is he willing to be seen eating with? And if we want to phrase this in the negative way, who is he not willing to be seen eating with? And this is an issue that isn't just an issue of, you know, maybe sometimes you, when you're faced with, that, faced with that reality of, you know, this person that, that I might have to sit with, I don't know them very well, and so I would rather sit with somebody else. Or this person, you know, maybe their social skills aren't quite very good. You know, we, we've had those situations where we talk to people and you just almost want to sarcastically tell them, okay, so this is when you now ask me a question because you're pulling information out of them. Maybe it's because I, I don't like their food. You know, I, I know a lot of times kids uh, from... Uh, cultures that are different than the American, American culture, when they go to school, maybe their parents are immigrants and they pack them food that they're used to. Maybe that food smells different and so nobody wants to sit with them or they get made fun of. Or maybe, again, it's just the reality of, you know, I, I don't know this person and I would rather just sit with somebody I know. It's not an issue like that of personal preference, but rather this dilemma of who Peter sits with, who he chooses to sit with or, or not sit with, but is at the very heart of the gospel message. We remember the gospel message throughout Galatians is that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, something that would have happened 20, 30 years before Galatians was written, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has forgiven our sins and he has set us free from what Galatians calls the present evil age. 
So God has set us free, not only from the guilt of our sin, but also the slavery to ourselves, as well as the systems of this world, the, the, the spiritual forces that want to enslave us. And so Galatians is, is saying, hey, believers in Jesus now live in this new age. We are part of what, I, what I've sort of called God's new creation community in Jesus. So Galatians spends a lot of time saying, what does it look like to live in that community? And, and when you're part of this community, what, what is your assurance? What is the thing that you look to as kind of verification that you do, in fact, belong there? That somebody's not going to be like, hey, what, what are you doing here? You can get out of here. I think a lot of us maybe struggle with that as, you know, kind of emotionally. We all sort of have that imposter syndrome where we're, a lot of times and maybe it's in our job or a circle of friends or people, we're, we're kind of wondering, boy, how long, of, how long is it before people realize I don't belong here? So what do we look to for our assurance that we are part of God's new creation community? And then finally, who gets to be part of it? And as we've already studied, what does it look like to live in this community, this new age, this new age of God's uh, work in Jesus? It means to live in his grace. What do we look to for our assurance? We look to Jesus and Jesus alone. And who gets to be part of it? Everybody. Doesn't matter your ethnicity, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, everybody. There is one people of God in Galatians. You know, it's always really important for us when we are reading the Bible, to, to re we want to read it with the big picture in mind. I think sometimes what happens is that when we read our Bible, we come to it and we expect each um, passage to kind of be like a separate story where they're totally unrelated to people, where we read, you know, kind of um, the Bible like there's, it's a newspaper with a whole bunch of different articles that are unrelated to each other. But that's not the best way to read the Bible. We want to read it with the big picture in mind. And we also want to remember that when we are reading the Bible, we are not reading stuff that is written directly to us. Like, the church in Galatia is not code word for Chinese gospel church. The Bible was not written directly to us, even though it is direct, written directly for us. And so when we read the Bible, we have to realize, hey, the people who are the direct recipients of the Bible, they kind of have a history. They have a cultural lens through which they read everything. They have a national narrative. They have a history that they've interpreted um, the events of the world through. And so when Paul is telling them that there is one multi-ethnic body, one multi-ethnic family, one, eth one multi-ethnic church that is God's people, they have to try and interpret that through everything that they have come to believe through reading what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. And I think a lot of times we, we have to realize that about ourselves too, that, that when we read our Bible, we don't come to it with a blank slate. We come to it with our own baggage. We come to it with our own assumptions. We come to it with our hopes. We come to it with our hurts. We come to it with our, our humors, our personalities. And so... When we read it, we try and understand what is God talking about in, in light of the life that we have experienced. And so, with that in mind, the big picture that I want to have everybody real, uh, read this passage in, in, in light of, think about it in terms of big success and big failure. The people who would have been familiar with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, would have been familiar with this pattern of big success big failure. In Exodus chapter 32, this is the moment after God has already saved Israel out of slavery. He has already rescued them from the evil Egyptian oppressors. He has destroyed the Egyptian army by parting the Red Sea and then having the waves crash back over them. He's provided for the nation of Israel in the desert. He has given them food, he has given them water, and he has brought them to this area called Mount Sinai, where God literally shows up. God's glory descends on Mount Sinai. It's like, it's that picture that maybe some of us might imagine what it would be like when God shows up. The earth can't handle it. The mountain starts to freak out. It starts earthquakes and fires and storms. And after everything that God has done for Israel to save them, he says, I am going to give you my law. 
as a way for you to understand what it looks like for you to live as my chosen people. This law I'm giving you is going to help provide a framework for our relationship. That's a lot of times what we think of when we think of the law, you know, the sacrifices and and the blood and, and the priests, about how to have our sins covered, forgiven. But also this law is going to help set you apart from the pagan nations that are around you. So God has already saved them. Salvation has already come. And now because of this, God says, this is what it looks like for me. This is what it looks like for you to be in a relationship with me as my people. And so if you, if you were the nation of Israel, put yourself in the nation of Israel's shoes. You've been ev- through everything that they've been through. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw the pillar of clouds, the pillar of fire leading them through. They saw how it is, Egypt, like gave them their possessions just so they would leave. They've seen God show up and rescue them. Now put yourself in Israel's shoes and imagine what is life going to be like as soon as difficulty comes around? Are we going to trust God or are we not? Because that situation happens. Moses is gone on Mount Sinai for too long. He's, he's already given, you know, he said he's going to be back, but he's, he's gone for too long. And, you know, maybe some of us know what that's like, where we've, we've been in situations before where we had this really awesome experience with God. Maybe, you know, if we were a student at WTC, where it really felt like, you know, God was present among us. Or we went to this really cool missions conference or a really good time worshiping with our friends. And we just felt like, oh, God was so close. But then we go back to real life and, you know, that person still annoys us. Or maybe we're dealing with some issues of, you know, maybe some mental health issues, issues of anxiety and depression. And we're like, I had this really good moment with God, but now I'm back to where it feels like my chest is being stepped on. How am I going to handle this? The nation of Israel, again, is is face of the reality that Moses is gone for too long. We have nothing. We don't have our leader to look to as a way of saying, hey, God is still with us. And so what do they do? Well, they start to freak out, too, because now our, our, our leader is gone. He's, he's dead. Maybe he ran away. What do we do? And so the nation of Israel talks to Aaron, who is the high priest of the nation, and says, we want you to make golden calves for us to represent the gods that delivered us out of Egypt. We want to be able to look to these gods and say, this is the god that I worship. And Aaron, Aaron does it. And again, think of the irony that God has just delivered the law in this story as a way of saying, this is what I want you to live like in order to show that you are different as my people than the pagan nations around you. And as soon as difficulty came around, as soon as Moses took too long, as soon as there was, there was wondering, what are we going to do? They failed. There is a heart-crushing repeated theme, as soon as pressure comes to the nation of Israel, they immediately forget what God has done. And so they build idols. They, they go in direct conflict with some of the first commandments about how you're not supposed to worship other gods. You're not supposed to make an image of any other gods. And what do they do? They do the very thing they weren't supposed to. And as a result of that, when, when Moses comes down, he like throws down the law. He's so mad. He's so just heartbroken every, over everything. And, and God says that he's going to destroy the nation. And, and Moses pleads for them. And so God doesn't destroy all of them. But there is still judgment because of the way that they had forgotten God's promise. And they decided, well, we're going to go our own way. And so in Galatians chapter 2, we have a very similar situation. God has just done something amazing to where Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and Cephas or Peter and the other Judean apostles, they join the right hand of fellowship and they say, there is now no distinction between Jewish people and Gentiles. There is one church of God. Gentiles do not need to be part of, become followers of the Mosaic law in order to become Christians. They don't have to be part of, they don't have to become like us in our culture to be part of us. And this is the situation that Peter is faced with. Peter, who is a a Jewish apostle from Jerusalem. Paul is telling the story about how everybody seems to be kind of sitting around and eating a, a common meal, both Jewish people and Gentiles together, which at that point, it was becoming part of Peter's normal life. 
When you read the, gospel, when you read the, the Gospels and then later in the book of Acts, there's moments where Peter, uh, God actually appears to Peter through an angel, an angel messenger and says, listen, Peter, I want you to understand now that the food laws that separated the nation of Israel from the Gentiles, they don't exist anymore because Jesus has made all foods clean. And so the idea was that you can now have meals with Gentile people. You don't have to set up that distinction between Jew and Gentile anymore. And so for a long time before this moment, Peter was living out the gospel. He was eating with Gentiles to show that there was no controversy. There was no distinction. We're all one in Christ. And Peter was the first, one of the first people to do that. But then all of a sudden, these influencers, people from Jerusalem come. You know, we, that, we use that phrase to Somebody is an influencer nowadays, like a so, social media influencer. They, they promote a product, and you know, that product gets bought because this important person who has a lot of uh, a strong reputation, they, they, they recommend it. And here we have these influencers from Jerusalem come, and Peter sees them, and he knows, hey, these people, they have social standing, and they're saying that Jews and Gentiles can't eat anymore. And so what happens is that Peter, you know, I don't know how dramatically it is. Maybe it's kind of like just kind of waiting for a moment where everybody seems distracted. And so he stands up and he slowly starts to walk away. Or maybe they, they come in and he sees them and they pop up right away. I, I don't know. But the, the, the story is that Peter has stopped eating with Gentiles. And when Paul sees this, maybe, maybe again, put yourself, in the, put yourself in, in the, into the story. Maybe Paul is coming back from the kitchen and he's got the food and he turns around and he sees Peter stand up and walk away and he's wondering what, what happened. And he looks over and he sees these influencers, these agitators, these troublemakers from Jerusalem and he sees them and he sees that Peter saw them and he knows that he got up and left because of it. What is Paul going to do? You know, we kind of live in a non-confrontational culture in a lot of ways. You know, the polite thing... Would, to do in a lot of social situations is that when you have to correct somebody, you do it privately. You praise publicly, but you correct privately. Or maybe you don't say anything at all. Maybe you kind of give the, you know, give the side eye. You, you know, kind of throw shade at somebody just by giving them side eyes. You don't say anything, but everybody knows. But it doesn't draw attention to it. Well, Paul doesn't do any of that stuff. Paul throws societal convention into the wind. And it's almost like, you know, in the olden days when you had a record player, you would, you know, if you wanted to be, make a dramatic entrance, you would pull the needle and the music screeches to a stop. That's basically what happens here because Paul interrupts the party. Because imagine the, the weight that has just happened after every good thing that has just been going on. The Spirit of God is moving in the apostles. People who were once enemies are now family members. And imagine what it must have been like to be the Gentiles. You know, people who were for a long time excluded. And they get the good news that, you know, that they're part of the family now too. And they're eating their food. And the person who is talking to them and sharing this good news, all of a sudden they look up from their food and they're gone. Maybe the Gentiles were like, well, where did Peter go? What happened? Maybe some of us know that feeling when, you know, we're, we're sitting with our friend at lunch. And all of a sudden, that other person comes by, you know, the person who normally sits at the cool kids' table. And they invite your friend to go sit with them. And all of a sudden, you're left there sitting alone. Paul can't stand this because he says Peter, through this action, is standing condemned. It's not uncommon for us to hear Christians be called hypocrites, where we say we believe one thing and our actions show something else. And in many ways, it's, it's a very fair thing to say about Christians. We, we are hypocrites. Some, some people have said that the root word or the, the meaning of hypocrite comes from this, this idea of actors going on to stage, and in the olden days they would wear masks to sort of show that they were a different character. And when they would come off the stage, they would take their mask off. That's kind of this idea of, of hypocrisy, where we, we say one thing, but then our actions and our appearance betray that. And I, I would imagine that a lot of us 
understand that accusation. That maybe there's moments in our life where we're confronted with the reality that we're a hypocrite too. The thing that I said I believed, my actions don't line up with that. You know, maybe we think about parents, parents with kids, and you know, you, you say, you know, going to church is important, and, and you know, we want to follow Jesus, but then you realize, I am so short-tempered with my child I don't let any of their mistakes slide, I pointed out, or, you know, I want to set a, a good example, but I'm not living what I believe. Or maybe, you know, kind of kids, maybe switch the tables, like, you know, we, we, we want to obey our parents, but then behind their backs, we're, we're, you know, being disrespectful, or even in our attitudes, that that whole idea of we're saying we're doing something, but our actions show something else. Spouses, people in friendships and relationships, we all know we all know that feeling when we realize, man, I really dropped the ball here. I really, I really failed. You know, I said I believed something. I said something was important to me. But at the first sign of danger, at the first sign of stress, I look for the easy way out. Maybe it's copying answers off somebody's homework, even though I said, you know, studying is important. Maybe it's talking bad about somebody, even though five minutes ago I was talking to them like they were my friend. And in our culture today, even though in many ways we are a non-confrontational culture, we also know those stories that because of you know, social media and how everybody's life is lived out publicly, when somebody of influence fails and they sort of get held to account, and you know they fail in a very public way, there, there's sort of this, you know, chant that if they, if they did something ignorant, they, you know, people, they have to, I, I, I get so annoyed when people clap to make a point while they're talking. You need to do better. You need to try harder. As if that emphasizes the point. And so the person then, when they're confronted with their failure, issues a heartfelt apology and they say, I, I realize I'm still learning a lot about, you know, X, Y, Z, about maybe different cultures, or maybe about different, you know, different practices, and so what I said came across as ignorant, and I promised to, to, to do better. What is Paul's response to Peter? Does he say, you need to do better. You need to try harder. Because remember, this, this whole issue of eating in Galatians with, with Gentiles, this wasn't just like a parent talking to their kid and saying, hey, buddy, I need you to, I need you to be nice to the new kid. Put yourself in their shoes. What, what would it feel like for you to be new? And you know, maybe you know that situation. Remember what it was like when you were new? This isn't just a situation of, you know, be nice to the new guy. Paul is saying the very gospel is at stake. Peter, you have betrayed the very gospel that you say you believed. Earlier in, in the book of Galatians, he, he opens up with saying, he's, he's writing to the audience, he's saying, I am shocked that you have abandoned the very gospel that you said that you believed. And in that context, he's talking about how uh, people are saying you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the Mosaic law, and he's saying, if you say that to Gentiles, if you say, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to follow the Mosaic law, then you have abandoned the gospel. And in this situation, Paul says to Peter, Peter, the fact that you have set up a distinction again between the Jews and the Gentiles, you have abandoned the gospel. You stand condemned. And Paul's suggestion to Peter, it's not a suggestion, Paul's command to Peter, it's not do more, not try harder, but it's to remember. Remember the gospel. You were not walking in line with the gospel. Remember the gospel, Paul says, which again is it's the essence of the letter. And here's something I was noticing. Again, this is not a private conversation where Paul pulls Peter aside and he says, hey, I, I don't want to embarrass you. But he, like, he publicly, for the lack of a better word, embarrasses Peter because he needs everybody to remember the gospel. This is something that everybody needs to hear. Everybody needs to hear this. You need to remember the gospel. And then he goes on to explain what it is, which is so nice, of, so nice of Paul. It's like, I can't believe you have forgotten the gospel. And here's the gospel in case you forgot what it is. 
This next section, verses 15 through 21, has a lot of important words in it, a lot of words that make a really big difference. Now, we know that this whole concept of, of language, even as it changes from culture to culture and, you know, sort of maybe definitions change from time to time, things that used to be okay to say, we can't, we're not, we don't say them anymore because we don't realize the hurt. But we know that, you know, words are powerful. Words make a big difference in people's lives, right? All you have to do is say, snow day, and every student feels happier in the world. All you have to say is there is a snow day because the snow day shows that there is too much snow. It's not safe to go outside. This next section includes a very powerful word, a word that makes all the difference in the world. It's a very heavy, it's a very, very big, big word. It's so important that in two verses it is said five times. The word is justified. What does it mean? What does it mean for Paul to say, we are not justified by works of the law, but we are justified by faith in Christ, or by the faith of Christ? What does it mean for for Paul to say, by works of the law, no one will be justified? In the beginning part of the sermon, I had mentioned that, you know, when when we read our Bibles, it's kind of tricky because when we read it, we have this lens that we read them through. Nobody is a blank slate. Everybody sort of reads their culture, their background, their experience into the Bible. And so sometimes we can, we we, we don't realize that we do that. And and we come to it with this whole, like, a, a, a whole concepts of, our culture's understanding of what something means that maybe the Bible wasn't necessarily talking about that, or like that's included, but that's not exactly what the Bible is talking about here. And you know, I, I realize that it's kind of impossible for, for anybody to totally separate themselves from their culture when reading the Bible. Nobody is a 100% objective reader. But the reality is that justification is not really a word that we use all that much in our daily language, is it? And so when we read that, we think to ourselves, well, what does that mean? Well, very simply, if we were to boil it down to like its basic understanding in, in Galatians as well as the rest of the Bible, the idea is that to be justified means that you've been faithful in what you were supposed to do. You were faithful in our relationship. You were faithful in your relationship with the holy God. You did what you were supposed to do. And I think everybody wrestles with that question of, you know, what do I look to? If I think about my relationship, standing before a holy God, the Bible talks a lot about my sin being separated from God. What do I look to then for an assurance that I have been faithful in my relationship with God, that I have done what I was supposed to do? And in the book of Galatians, they ask themselves that question. What do I look to for an assurance that I have been faithful in my relationship, that I have done what I am supposed to do as somebody who trusts Christ. You know, the old schoolhouse rock from the 70s, they would do a lot of stuff about how a bill is made, how Congress passes a law. You know, they're pretty old school videos, and I listen to a civics podcast um, that talks about you know, the, our government from an eighth grade perspective, which is good because that's about the level that I can understand. And so we we ask ourselves this question. When we think about laws that are made, what is the principle that is behind that law that is being made? In our country, maybe in a different culture, everybody makes laws that we're supposed to follow, whether it's on the books or it's sort of an unspoken law. But I think it's fair to say that at the foundation of all of those laws is this idea of a relationship. How do we establish rules? How do we establish boundaries? How do we sort of codify them into laws, whether it's spoken or unspoken, in such a way to ensure that the relationships that exist in our society are kept safe? That the the things that the relationships that we see as good are promoted? What laws do we put in place to make sure that those relationships that exist in a societal contract are able to flourish. And, and so we know that these laws aren't, are, are, excuse me, aren't arbitrary. 
You know, we think about the, the phrase Taco Tuesday, where it's like, it's almost like a law that in a school cafeteria, t Tuesday is just Taco Tuesday. Well, why? That's kind of an arbitrary thing. Okay, maybe they, maybe they sound the same, so of course they would go together. But, you know, fundamentally there's no difference between eating a taco on Tuesday and a taco on Friday. It's, n it's not an arbitrary thing. Our laws are meant to show that whatever is being talked about is important. What should be maintained? What should be encouraged? What should be promoted? And we think even, even like seatbelt laws, because life is important. You have to wear your seatbelt because you are far more likely to be injured or killed in a car accident if you don't wear your seatbelt. And so if we, want to, if we want to convey the idea that life is sacred, life is important, and the insurance companies sure want to convey that idea too, you wear your seatbelt, even though you know, sometimes you're just going five minutes down the road. Why does it make a big difference? Because life is important. Even the same thing with, sp with speed limit laws. Why do we drive 25 miles an hour in a residential zone? Well, because it's dangerous to life if you drive 70. And the consequences that are associated with breaking those laws, they, they show the scale of the seriousness of that relationship and the value that is meant to be portrayed in, in that relationship. So for example, if you break a minor traffic law, let's just say um, you, know, you, you get caught not wearing your seatbelt. You pay a fine, you pay a small fine. But if you do something that actually harms somebody and it was your fault and it was preventable and it was an act of negligence, the consequences are much more severe. We think about laws that are on the books about murder. The reason why those are so, the, the consequences of those, those crimes are so severe is because somebody has lost their life. It's a totally different penalty from jaywalking because the severity of the broken relationship that exists between people is something that can't be fixed. And I think one of the things that people also realize nowadays is that we realize that when laws affect people in different ways, where maybe one class of people is adversely affected because of this law, and we see how it hurts that one, that one class of people, maybe economically they're disadvantaged, or maybe their legal protection isn't quite as good as other people's. We, we are rightfully upset. We get mad when we hear judges favor one class of people over another, and, and rightfully so. The Bible even talks about that too, about how judges aren't supposed to you know, tip the scales in favor of the wealthy or even tip the scales in favor of the poor. They're supposed to be equal because people are supposed to be treated the same. So how does all of this apply to Galatians? This is really interesting because this is where Paul, when he's talking to his audience, he's, he's, he's almost, you can sense the frustration where it's like, guys, we, we all know this. After he just got done saying, we are not justified by works of the law, meaning by work, you know, showing our checklist of all of the, the good things that we've done and following God's law about what it looks like to be the nation of Israel, keeping all the commandments, keeping all the sacrifices, that's not the thing that you look to to say, this is what it means to be accepted in God's sight. It seems so countercultural, so counterintuitive. But Paul is saying, hey, come on, guys, we all know this. This is, this is Bible 101, Paul seems to be saying. And, and maybe, again, we've been in that situation where somebody is like, come on, you know this, and we didn't know that, but you have to play it off like you did. Or you've been in that situation where, yeah, I knew it, and I really, really blew it. Paul says that works of the law are not the thing that the Galatians, and they're by, by definition, us, they are not the thing that we look to for the assurance that we have been faithful in our relationship with God. Works of the law are not the thing that we look to to say, I have obeyed God, and I have fulfilled all of my requirements of being God's people. And I think that's really surprising for us to hear for two reasons. Number one, when you read the Bible, especially the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, it seems that God is very serious about them following the law. 
And not just parts of it that are easy, but obeying all of it. And not just the parts about the sacrifices and the priests and the animals and the blood, but serious about their fabric, serious about the seeds that they sow in their fields. He is very, very serious about all of it to make sure that they don't act like their pagan neighbors. He's so serious, in fact, that in, in parts of Deuteronomy, he says, there, look, if you follow the law, there's going to be blessings, there's going to be life, there's going to be peace, there's going to be, there's going to be, your crops are going to flourish, everybody's going to love you. But if you consistently break the law, then there's going to be consequences. There's going to be curses. There's going to be exile. There's going to be death. There's going to be plagues. There's going to be illness. And so God sure seems really serious about the law as being part of his people. And I think the other thing that might surprise us is that human nature loves checklists. Human nature kicks back against the idea that it's not what you do that shows that you've been faithful in your relationship to God. We love our checklists, don't we? Even non-religious people, people who don't have time for, for the church, they want to be able to say, look at all of the things that I do that prove I am a good person. I don't do this. I do this. I am a good person because of all the things that I do. I'm not like those people because they do X, Y, and Z, but I do A, B, and C. So therefore, I've been faithful in my relationship to society. And I think a lot of times, even as Christians, that's what we boil it down to too. Just tell me what I need to do. In, the, in this sermon, tell me my practical application points. Because we love to have checklists the, where we can cross things off. And, and here's the thing. There, there are good things in that. There, there are obvious examples to where practical application is very, very important. But we have to ask ourselves as Christians, even people who say that we believe in Christ and that my faith saves me or that Jesus saves me, what do we look to for our assurance that we have been faithful to God? What do we look to for our assurance that God accepts us as we are? Is it our feelings? How close we feel to God? Is it our place in society? You know, prosperity? Does, does that mean that God is happy with me? Or, or health? If I'm, if I'm healthy, that must mean that God accepts me. But if I'm not healthy, then maybe God is angry at me. Is it our good, good works, quote unquote, even though that we don't have sort of the mosaic law that we point to about circumcision and food laws and dietary laws. We still have, but I did my Bible reading. I went to church. Every time the church doors are open, I'm there. Who cares if it's putting a tremendous strain on my family that I'm always doing church things rather than loving them and caring for them. What do we look to for the assurance that God has accepted us and that we have been faithful in our relationship with him? Because if it's not the law, well, then what, what is the law even there for? You know, we, we, we know that we love boxes that we can check and say, because I've done all of these things, I know God will love me. And then later on in Galatians chapters 3 and 4, Paul goes into greater detail talking about what exactly the purpose of the law was, why God gave it to Israel, even though it wasn't there for them to say, check out this box, check out this to-do list that is to done, and I've done it all, and God's going to love me. But again, we want to be reminded that human nature has this natural tendency where we love to have our checklists and we love to point out the differences between us and people who are not like us and why we are better than them. And Paul even goes on to, to explain a little bit about this. He, he says in, in verses 17 where he says that in saying that the law, like you don't need to be justified, are, are we therefore saying that God is on the side of sinners? What, he, what he's saying there is like according to sort of Jewish custom, Gentiles were by definition 
sinners because they didn't have the law. And so everything that they were doing, because it was not guided by God's Mosaic law, by God's covenant agreement, everything they were doing was sinning. And so for the, for the Gentiles, for, for, for the Jewish people, Gentiles were fundamentally sinful people. But maybe one of the reasons why God gave the law to Moses is to help Israel realize that, you know, maybe they're just like the Gentiles. God give, didn't give them the law as a way to sort of say, hey, you guys are really awesome, and I want you to keep being really awesome. I didn't save you because you were great, because you were righteous, because you were strong in numbers. God says, in, I think in the book of Deuteronomy, but he says, I saved you because I loved you. God gave the law in many ways to, to show the nation of Israel, hey, you are just as prone to the same sin as the Gentiles. And I am giving you this law to help create a boundary so that you don't fall into the same sins and failures as they do. So as we come to the last part of this passage, we, we ask ourselves, so if it's not works of the law that show that we have been faithful in our relationship with God, if it is not faith, or if it's not works of the law that show that we are justified, why is it Christ? Why does Jesus do what the law could not do? As it says in verses 15 and through 18, it says that, we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith and not works of the law. So what is it about Jesus that justifies? What is it about faith and trust in Jesus, the faith that we show him, as well as the faith that we put in what he has done? Why is that the magic ticket? Why does that do what works of the law could never do? Why is Jesus our justification? Why is he the key for our relationship with God? How does looking to Jesus for the assurance that we have been accepted by God and that, that we, have, we have been faithful in our relationship, why is it Jesus? And this is the reason, again, like Paul says, he, it, he had to do it in front of everybody because everybody needs to hear this, as a church body, the fundamental reason why is that Jesus is our justification, the fundamental truth of the gospel that sets it apart from all the other religions, for all the other cultural trends of the world, all the other philosophies, all of the other creeds that people want to put in their, on, on, on a sign in their yard, is the fact that for what is true of Jesus is true of me. What is true of Jesus is true of me. What is true of Jesus is true of those who trust in him. That when God looks at us, those who trust in Jesus, he does not see our failures, he does not see our sins, but rather he sees Jesus Christ. He sees Jesus' obedience he sees Jesus' perfection. He, he sees Jesus and the full love that he showed his father in everything that he did, in all the ways that he fulfilled the law, in all the ways that he did not sin, in all the ways that he did exactly what he was supposed to do. When we trust in Jesus, Jesus' perfection is given to us. When Jesus suffered the consequences of our sin, as well as the broken evilness of this world in this present evil age, when he was crucified on the cross, paying the cost that it takes to restore our relationship with God, not only just the punishment, but also the restoration, that picture of biblical justice, not just about punishing what is wrong, but doing what is necessary to make sure the relationship gets restored. When Jesus did that, that is given to us. We, as Paul said, are crucified with Christ. 
and the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead by the Spirit of God, that is true of us too. We have been given the Spirit of God. Which means that, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And so all those other distinctions that the world tries to throw at us about our ethnicity, about our race, about our gender, about you know, who we may or may not be attracted to, how we feel about our bodies, the amount of money that's in our bank account, the things that we've done wrong, the things that we've done right, all of that stuff before God, it doesn't matter because the only thing that matters is Jesus living in you. So your identity is not your ethnicity. It's not your past. It's not your future. It's not your mistakes. It's Jesus. And we as a church need to be reminded of this all the time. And it comes down to this very simple question of why. Why is all of this true? Why does God do this to a people who are so prone to constantly run back to our checklists and say, ah, you see, God, because I did all of these things, now you have to love me. And as soon as difficulty comes around, we turn and we walk away from God looking for the easy way out. Maybe it's to protect ourselves. Why does God do this when that is the inclination of our heart? Or how we so easily put up barriers between people who are not like us, and we put up all these rules and regulations to show that we're better than everybody? Why does God intentionally kick those walls down? Well, as it says in Galatians chapter 2, it's because Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. Why are we justified by faith in Jesus? Because Jesus loves us. Why do we look to the assurance that we have been accepted before God and that, that even that we have done what we're supposed to do in our relationship? Because Jesus loves us. Why do we go forward in our life and following God and, and putting ourselves in second place, or maybe even fifth place, by dying to ourselves and choosing to follow Jesus, even when it's difficult? Well, it's because Jesus loves us and he gave himself for us. We are justified by faith in Jesus because of God's great love for us. We're going to sing uh, as a response, Christ lives in me. But as I pray, just again, let's, let's let our hearts rest in that fact. That this is all done because of God's great love for us in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the assurance that comes from knowing that in Jesus our sin has been forgiven. That it is no longer us who live, but Jesus through the Spirit that lives in us. We thank you that you have given us the gift of what it means to be faithful in a relationship with you. Apart from our ability to obey you. And so we ask that as a response to that, our hearts would be filled with love and joy as a way of celebrating the good news of the gospel of Jesus, Christ in us, Christ working in us, and the Spirit of God continuing to transform us into people who are like him. We pray all this in your name. Amen.